So now is the time for uh, questions, comments, discussion. Maybe I can start uh, with a question then. <laughs> I don't know if it's a fully formed question, but I was, um, uh, it's it's an, a sort of open comment uh, about both your 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 talks. Um, I was wondering, listening to to your talk, uh, Masako, um, what what exactly does uh, the analysis of inflectional morphemes reveal uh, that is, let's say, larger or um, underneath? Um, what what a, a semantic analysis of discourse could could tell us, right? And um, this leads me to a sort of of uh, comparative question with Thomas's uh, Thomas's talk. Uh, Thomas, I was I was really struck by what you called toward the end of your talk a pre sort of pre predication, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Uh, so um, a predication <clears throat> that uh, delimits terms as terms in order to allow for, for predication. So I don't want to you know, force, forcefully build a sort of bridge between uh, your two talks, but what I, what I can see or hear in both cases is that there is some, let's say, um, uh, some some underground work uh, going on uh, in language or under semantic uh, work going on in language, uh, a sort of pre pre foundational work uh, that would be um, that would lead to to a sort of of um, well maybe maybe a perspective that we could call archi political or micro political. Uh, maybe in the sense, you know, Nietzsche famously said somewhere, I don't remember exactly where, that metaphysics uh, was rooted in grammar. Um, maybe we could say, um, after hearing both your talks, that uh, politics is rooted either in these uh, impoverished morphemes or in these pre-predicative determinations. Thank you so much for your question. Um, the um, you are asking about inflectional morphemes. And in the case of um, grammatical case endings, I would say that the uh, when you have a, a really, really big uh, set of uh, texts, and even if um, they are uh, on different topics and, and news coverage or whatever, you know, the different topics, um, if you follow the uh, uh, specific specific social actors and how they are represented in, with grammatical cases, um, you can actually see, uh, and that's our, our, our claim, you can actually see uh, who is being uh, promoted and demoted as an agent or, or as a partner uh, or who is being snubbed um, and so I would say that the uh, inflectional grammatical markers um, actually sort of like they 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 are um, they produce some sort of a contour of discourse who is actually being kind of uh, very visible and and very active and when you combine let's say as I as I was talking about the um, certain lexical items uh, you know states and, and and political leaders you could actually see uh, some some justification for for let's say Putin leadership for example and so uh, this is this is sort of like a, a very sort of overarching story that you could actually see and it's not something that, you would notice when you are reading one or two texts. Um, but if you actually read these texts and similar texts, then you would incrementally sort of um, uh, uh, get this kind of image of certain social actors, states and presidents. And, and that's, what the, that, that's what we are we're trying to do. Um, of course, it's not just the morphemes that 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 do this, um, and we do other things as well. But uh, we wanted to show that these tiny little things can be also very helpful. Thank you, <clears throat> Thomas. Do you want to 
Yeah, you are right that those talks were about underlying either stories or conditions or preconditions. Um, in the case of the stone, uh, these underlying signs, uh, they are like an anticip another anticipation of loss. Well, because they, 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 are, they are put before, uh, before the stone is placed in view of the impossibility to avoid the, 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 the stone's loss, right? Um, and in the in in in, in the grammatical field, um, uh, so when when uh, uh, Boetius translates onoma uh, or, or nomen into or replaces nomen by terminus, uh, this goes first for it's like a translation of horos, and it uh, is applied to uh, words as. Uh, borders uh, uh, marking the limits of, of, of a sentence, of propositio. But at the same time, terminus uh, is also considered outside of propositio, outside the sentence, as if every word turned into a term where itself, itself an expanding field. And therefore, in, in scholasticism, this need or the desire to come up with a theory of suppositions. So each terminus can be taken in different, in many different ways. And the desire is to come up with a number to count these uh, many ways in which term subsists or counts as. Um, so the aim of this theory is to come up with a, with a sum, a finite number of the terms properties. Um, but the various, theories of supposition don't add up. They often contradict each other. They, if not, attack each other. Um, <laughs> and these uh, theories of suppositions remain as an open-ended or disintegrating uh, resummating maze, as I called it. Uh, um, and th th there is one, nevertheless, there's one suppositio this suppositio materialis, the material supposition that is added to the number of all other uh, suppositions, but in a certain way, it doesn't add up to the sum, but is the very reason for that you cannot count, you cannot count the numbers of suppositions. This material supposition is neither nor any of these other, it is neither sign, uh, significatio nor can it be replaced by the thing itself. It is what remains when you subtract all, subtract all the other suppositions. It is kind of minus. It is like a third that is uh, subtracted from the number of suppositions, a tail minus. Uh, and the materiality of this, of, this, of this term as term, and it is often called the term itself, is not a positivity, it is not an essence, but is, it is void. It is like in Zachary's talk, none. The proper name of this, uh, of the, the term that remains materialita uh, would be none. Uh, it is, it is uh, Occam says it is the word spoken and the sign written, but without signification. It is, it is what, uh, what, what one may call a quotation, a word that is quoted, but we don't really know what that means. Yeah. And this is probably not an underlying story, but the underlying undoing of narration of storytelling uh, in as far as narration and storytelling depend on words as terms. Thank you. Uh, so we have five raised hands. Uh, Suzanne, I believe you're the first, the next. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, this is a question for Masako. Um, and it might be a bit of a follow-up from the, the question that Peter asked you earlier about, you know, what does this analysis do that could not be done by, by a semantic analysis? But I actually want to sort of take that in the other direction and 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 wonder whether 
uh, you know, your answer, I think, to Peter was, well, you know, we're doing this and one can also do that, right? But I'm, so my question, and it, it was sparked by um, the fact that, you know, I have had to, given the research I'm doing right now, analyze uh, a, a number of speeches, political speeches by Mussolini, right? So, you know, fascist speeches. And and one thing that is very striking <clears throat> in the speeches is the percentage of silence, right? So the, where, where nothing is being said, right? And, and, um, and, and the reason I'm bringing up the silence is um, because I'm wondering uh, about how one can fake inflection in the grammatical sense, also with inflection in a kind of audio sense, um, and 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 therefore ask you about the stability of the relationship between these memes, right, and 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 um, and meaning. And, and, and in other words, you know, why would the dative signify X, right? Um, you know, says who, and you know, how does that get established? What if in fact, um, that's not a given? And if it's not a given, then how would one, you know, make the argument for the relationship? Thank you, Suzanne, for a very sort of like challenging question. Um, um, so um, I, I will I will start with the, your last uh, comment about the the case endings and it, the uh, their semantics. Um, it, the these um, ideas come from the cognitive linguistics uh, um, research on um, sort of the, the like the abstract meaning of of grammatical case, and so uh, this is as actually oh is taken as as a given and um the, these these are the article by yanda and and the um uh, the book by yanda and clancy they are actually sort of they co compilated uh, um, um, a multitude of texts and and they analyzed and they actually extracted abstract meanings of of case endings so that's one uh sort of um uh, base that that we actually sort of used, but at the same time um, um, we also look at uh, the actual text. We usually look at the um, the the um, uh, parts of text where the dative case occurs, and 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 look at concordances. So um, we actually do not just the counting, but also the uh, uh, the actual sort of the sentences and 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 texts. So um, in this way, and in addition to that. I didn't talk about this, but we actually talked about we we actually wrote about the type of verbs that are used and and uh, the semantic features of the verbs that 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 actually come with with uh, accompany the the nominative case, for example, or the dative case. So we have some other sort of supporting evidence for for um, for 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 making this claim. Um, as far as the silence is concerned, that's a very good question, and I think it's related to um, a question about how do you measure uh, zero, like the absence, right? Yeah, um, and uh, that's been an, um, uh, a weakness in, in corpus linguistics when you are looking for features. On the other hand, there are ways to do it. You, you can actually compare um, you know, different different sets, different corpora, and 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 uh, then you can reveal differences uh, and say that this corpora is actually very different, and it's 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 it has feature X, whereas the other corpora doesn't. So you can actually sort of find out. And um, I don't know the technology of it. It in principle, I think the audio. Uh, could be used or it can be tagged uh, in a text um, to indicate that there is a, a, a pause. And um, that way you would be able to, to, uh, to identify 
um, uh, the um, unusual frequency of pauses. Can I just very quickly follow up because I mean, uh, you know, I mean, it's not just pauses and signs, but you know, what it also then could be is irony, right? In other words, what if, you know, um, uh, the data is embedded in, in, is deeply ironic. And then how would that be? That's um, what I mean by tone, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, irony is, 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 is uh, um, th there are ways to probably, irony is difficult. Sarcasm is difficult to measure. I, I have to say it's, that's, that's very difficult. Um, uh, there are attempts at um, uh, measuring the positivity or negativity of evaluative statements, but that's actually it's 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 short of what you're looking for. So my my answer is uh, we can't do it yet. <laughs> I believe Tim, you are next. Yes, my thank you. My question is related. I really enjoyed this panel. Um, it's for Masako, um, and um, your last answer made me, is going to make me change my question slightly. But um, I, I, when you said you said at one point in your talk, when we look at the relative um, uh, prominence between cases, we can see the political ideology. And I wanted to ask you about this claim because um, it seems to me that one um, um, dimension of your of your method, and it seems to me a very important one, is that what what analysing these dative case, uh, these different cases, enables you to do is count. In other words, I mean, so counting is completely central to your method. But what you're counting, it seems to me, is essentially agency. I mean, it's essentially um, you know who is being snubbed, who is uh, has agency in a particular speech, who how are individual agents being being placed and my my question is um is there not um a particular ideology that is in fact providing you with the frame for your method and that is an ideology that is predicated upon the importance of the individual and the importance of agency in other words liberalism so so is there a kind of um, absent political ideology that is framing your your method um, from at the outset, uh, and 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 the, the the sort of little tweak that I wanted to make in response to your 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 um, response to um, is to Suzanne is that for an analyst like Voloshinov, the smallest possible or the minimal indivisible unit is not you know a morpheme or a word or a concept or a term. It is the speech act and and the reason why the speech act is the minimal um unit is because it is a dynamic event that takes place between speakers in a real speaking situation and the benefit of the speech act as the minimal um signifying unit is that you can precisely uh, un, uh, you know account for sarcasm and irony and so on um because both parties understand it um <clears throat> so that was my my question for you and then <clears throat> for um thomas i just wanted to it's really an invitation it's not a question but i i wanted to i was so intrigued by by masako's um um approach and in particular the predicate of this minimal indivisible unit and i just wanted to ask you thomas what is for you the minimal minimal indivisible the minimal indivisible unit of analysis in your in your in your um um, in your work, it doesn't seem to be term. You seem to be so invested and interested in in a sort of multiplicity within the the, the way that the term can function. So I just wondered: to, is that a relevant question for you? Like the minimal indivisible units. So thank you. those are my those are my questions. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so I see I see several questions. Um, so um, the uh, uh, yes, we are counting uh, uh, forms, but we are actually counting in such a way that uh, uh, we are looking at what is significant. 
so it's not like we are we're actually counting and 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 you know which which word is is really you know taking a lot of space but it's this ex extraordinary sort of like occurrences compared to what we expect in a, a regular uh, regular language usage. Uh, I, I wanted to clarify that. Um, and as far as the particular ideology is concerned, um, the case endings would not be sufficient, I don't think, uh, to, to actually tell you uh, what kind of um, what kind of ideas uh, or a consistent uh, uh, patterns of thought uh, uh, appears in, in the uh, multitude of texts. Uh, what we are doing right now is actually, it's in building on a keyword analysis and we are actually looking at ways to, um, to um, measure associative links, what kind of, uh, what, associative links. So what what kind of keywords tend to co-occur within a text? And um, this method, uh, we actually we it's it's actually forthcoming in, in 2022. Um, um, and um, this this method would would show how um, events, world events and news coverage, are framed differently in, let's say, in extremist texts as uh, compared to the mainstream text. So um, we're going somewhere else. You're right that the uh, the case endings would would be able to to sort of uh, give you some schematic idea of, of of the players and agencies, but uh, we are also looking at how how the um, um, the same event is actually framed differently and and more and more sort of associations are added on and and then we actually identify certain ideological lines like the EU is 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 going to to fall apart NATO is not use, useful uh, and and so on and so forth these 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 narrative lines can be identified uh, by a different different method Thank you, Masako. Uh, Thomas, do you want to jump in? Uh, thank you, Tim, for this invitation. Uh, I, uh, the minimal significant indivisible unit, I, I don't think that there's such a thing. Uh, the the, the, the uh, placing and uh, the placing and uh, desire to maintain term, both the stone and the word as term, they are both uh, supported uh, by, by hints towards the impossibility of the, the, the generation and maintenance of such, a, of such a claim or such a desire for indivisibility. The, be that a formal or semantic indivisibility in the case of the word as term, or the irreplaceability and individuality of the, the, the stone as term. Uh, so if I, if I would want to give you a very short answer, uh, ironically, the, 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 the one word I would come up with, the, 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 the smallest uh, unit I can think of is not atom, but tom. So that, 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 that would be the word that would uh, condensate the, the, indi the, the, the visibility of, uh, uh, but without rules of what seems to be a given entity or a given uh, individual uh, thing or, or, or word. So it's a, it's a morphine, in fact, right, Tom? Yeah, but that's, I, I said ironical. The answer is ironical. So. <laughs> It, it, it is shut through with pauses and silences and undertones and overtones. And, uh, thank you. Thank you. Nils, you have a question? Um, yeah, thanks. Um, uh, and I'm, I, I want to pick, or I wanted to pick up, and I will uh, pick up on a term that uh, Tom uh, 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 just used, uh, that's the word claim. And uh, I saw Bob talks. Um, 
uh, as correspondences um, about claiming and reclaiming um, and making claims and uh, claiming being the calling out by virtue of, of a right or an authority. And um, I, uh, when Thomas, uh, when Thomas, when you talked about grounding and landmarks, I, I uh, wondered um, how this determination, um, determination of terms and uh, in the other talk, the morphemes and the one registering or the two, the one registering here, um, uh, kind of build up some kind of relation. And a, a particular term came uh, to mind. And um, I wonder if both of you have something to say about it. And that's the term in situ, this being in place or being in the right place. Um, and um, uh, which we have to relate to the ex situ, um, not in the original place. And who determines this positioning or this term and the position and to um, turn that maybe into a more political question and uh, in mind what we heard this morning um, about loss and um, um, about remains, um, uh, two talks that uh, made me think about ending and beginnings uh, or the possibility of ending and beginning or the, 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 the question how to determine uh, uh, when something begins and when something ends um, with regard to loss and, and, and remains. And uh, I think both talks in this afternoon were talking about ongoing and or or against going on um, uh, with the backdrop of this beginning and ending in uh, uh, working through and with language. And so um, uh, I wonder if you have um, uh, some, some something to say about your own propositioning um, uh, in situ versus ex situ in this relationship, um, how you come to terms with the, the material. Shall, shall I go first? Please. Don't, don't, um, um, I, I hope I, I can answer this question. It, it's very sophisticated for me. Um, so, um, uh, how to come to terms with the uh, um, uh, the the research question as as a claim? Is that did I understand your question? Uh, is it is it what what your, your yeah? It's it's question? regarding the the uh, the positioning of yourself as somebody who makes the claims or determines terms. Um, uh, where you have to say they are in place and, and somebody else says they are not in place, they're ex situ. And, and um, so, you know, placing yourself in this ongoing or uh, a process of, of looking at something, so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think I think this is this is actually, you know, the uh, I, I, I guess um, um, we use the, the, the term claim because uh, we we measure things and we, we measure frequencies and and uh, um, we have to decide on what to measure and and we have to interpret the, the data. So so there, even when you are actually uh, sort of extracting the data and, and the extraction data extraction itself is automatic, but you have to first decide on what to measure and that's subjective. And, and then when, once you get the results, you actually have to interpret it, uh, interpret the data. So that's subjective, but at least you have empirical data. And so um, uh, we, we, we say based on the data, we can say this, but of course there, there's a, uh, there is a room for subjectivity. And, and that's why uh, we, we call this a claim and, um, and somebody needs to reproduce it and, and say, you know, it's the same results. And um, um, maybe, maybe they will 
they will expand the, the data set, you know, a larger text, and then they might come up with a more sort of rigorous uh, interpretation. So it's, it's an ongoing, I think it should be an ongoing uh, process um, that the claim has to be modified, has to be, has to be um, uh, corrected. And so I, I think it's an ongoing process and it's research has to be an ongoing process, cannot have any kind of like the end point. Um, your question seems to be, how do you place yourself in relation to uh, placing or displacing term? But that presupposes that there is a self that would relate to terms. And this is, I, 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 I wouldn't agree with, the, with that presupposition. Uh, because you, you can, uh, this question of the self, of the term itself, uh, comes up when uh, these uh, scholastic thinkers um, feel the need of inventing a material supposition, which seems to be, uh, or, or, or seems to be, seems to take the place of the term itself, but the self has no positive connotations. It is neither this nor that. It is it is uh, not significatio, nor uh, uh, replacing the thing itself. Uh, um, uh, it is like uh, a zero again, a void, uh, and uh, or a question mark. I, I was and another remark maybe concerning the term itself and the self of the term is, I'm still with this um, speech of uh, that Juliet showed uh, of the sister talking as her brother's keeper. And, and I'm thinking about uh, the installation of the term, of the, the stone as term. Um, uh, as an anticipation of loss, another scene anticipating and explicitly so the future loss of, of this stone. And she um, does not talk about her brother's self, uh, but uh, uh, she talks about her brother. And then she says, you should also remind him as, and as, and as, and as. And uh, then she comes up with the word human, but the word human only condenses the impossibility to come up with a number, uh, with a finite number of who he is as and as. You will never find out. There is no given self that can be placed and replaced. Uh, so this is not simply a mourning of the loss of a given self, but she talks about anger as if saying, stop turning the stone into a term or stop turning words into terms. Uh, rather stay with the stone that you cannot place and replace and stay with the words uh, of which you, you don't really know what they are and how they are and whether they are at all. I, uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, just to uh, uh, clarify, I, I carefully try to avoid, and I think I did avoid the word self actually in my question and talk at this one particular point um, about the one and not, you might call it none with uh, uh, Zachary's words, but I, you know, avoided the word self um, uh, there carefully. But thank you so much. Yeah. Yanis, I believe you are next. Thank you. Um, and thank you both for the wonderful talks. I have one short question for each. Um, for Masako, I actually, my question relates to what Suzanne and Tim um, were asking. So it's about the method. But while their kind of emphasis was on performativity and orality, uh, mine is more on the construction of the corpus. Um, and I was wondering whether. I mean, we were talking about political utterances and pronouncements, but obviously in different contexts and in different media. Is that correct? 
So if that's the case, then how do you account in your analysis for these contextual differences and kind of the uh, differences in the medium of, of that performance? Um, and for, for Thomas, I was fascinated by your discussion of Ori in, in ancient Greece. Um, so the, the boundary stone, especially the ones um, who speak, who say, I am the boundary stone of the Agora. And as you know, it's not uncommon to have objects declaring, you know, saying, I am this, or I belong to this person. So I was wondering whether you could say a bit more about that act of, you know, that enactment of agency and that act of speech uh, in relation to your discussion about the term term. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Yanis. This is, I, I'm really happy to, to answer this question because it's a great question. Um, so you had a question about the reference corpus. Yeah, and, and you're right about the contextualization. And so um, uh, I should be, we should be careful, um, you know, when you're using the uh, synchronic corpus from, let's say, uh, 2015, that means the texts, um, um, a really contemporary text. Um, we are actually looking at what is surprising and what is prominent from the viewpoint of the contemporary reader. Um, but uh, we, we know that um, it, when you are interpreting um, the, um, uh, the text from the viewpoint of the historical reader, you have to um, actually use some other reference corpus. Um, so we did that. Uh, actually, we, 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 we experimented with this, um, taking the, the socialist president's texts uh, from the uh, very, very boring normalization period. And uh, we uh, uh, conducted the keyword analysis uh, using two different reference corpora. One was from the, uh, from the socialist period and, and that would actually reflect what the uh, reader might have found striking. And the other one uh, from the contemporary reference corpus that would uh, give some different set of keywords that would reveal what the contemporary reader might find striking. And we actually saw the differences. So, um, so you're right about uh, about uh, taking the one and single reference corpus to 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 uh, to to uh, um, extract key uh, key morphs. Um, but if in this in this case, I think grammatical functions probably would not would not uh, be so far away uh, if you're looking at speeches from 1918 to uh, let's say 20, I think Zeman's speech was from 20, 2016, 17, something like that. So as far as the keyword uh, analysis is, is concerned, I think, uh, I think we are actually uh, playing on a safe ground. Thomas. Yes, this, uh, I think it's a very irritating uh, scene and it, 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 you're right, uh, not only these uh, boundary stones have such inscriptions, the jugs, and you find it in pottery, you find it in tombstones, um, that the, a reader who passes by is that stone uh, has to read out loud the inscription. And in that way, displacing his voice or borrowing his voice uh, to the stone, uh, uh, supplementing the stone with what the stone does not have. And it, to me, it seems like a, um, a scene that condenses the irreplaceability of of voice, that uh, voice is never 
someone's own voice, but a voice can be, uh, voices are around and they cannot really be identified as someone's voice. Uh, um, um, they are not given and taken back, but they are uh, displaceable from before the beginning, from before they are, they are applied to someone as, as, as someone's property or um, um, a possession. But much more could be said about this, uh, about this uh, uh, very irritating uh, relation between the inscription and the necessity or the need to give voice to uh, such a sentence, I am the boundary stone. Yeah. So the stone is borrowing the voice of the passerby. In a way, or the yeah. passerby is invited mm. or uh, even, even forced mm. to give voice to the stone. Because reading in, in a certain, at a certain time, at least in ancient Greek, Greece, uh, is always read out loud. So you have to, the text is like a partition and you, it only will be uh, come, come to, into its own once mm read out loud, once spoken. And that seems to be the, uh, this is the invitation or the, 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 the uh, obligation that uh, is, uh, is uh, uh, at work here. Um, but but, but to, to speak out loud, that sentence uh, emphasizes on that there is no voice, no, no, no proper voice. That, not, and then not only the stone does not have a, a voice, but the one uh, who speaks out, I am the stone, uh, uh, remains in a certain way unable to reappropriate uh, uh, the voice that says, I am the stone mm -hmm. uh, in the first place or back before the first place. Great, thank you. Thank you. Zach, you had a question? Yeah, thanks, uh, Marco and Thomas, for those talks. I, and I have two sort of comments and questions, one for each of you. Um, Marco, I'm trying to sort of think through the, the, the work that you shared with us and your method in terms of what's happening with the political discourse here in the United States. Um, and uh, I thought it was not that I want to go back to that nouniness versus verbiness um, um, difference. I think that's illuminating when I think about that, say, the difference between a sentence like, crime is on the rise in Chicago versus criminals rule the streets of Chicago, or even worse, thugs are rampaging through the streets of Chicago, which are all very sort of verby, um, um, verby sentences, right? So there is not, it's about responsibility, but in a different way from um, what you were describing. And of course, criminals rule the streets of Chicago is morphologically not distinguishable from patriots gather at the Capitol or patriots are gathering at the Capitol. The, the morphological difference is it's insignificant compared to let's say the semantic difference, right? Um, but that might be helpful because maybe, and I suspect that if you look at political statements by the Trump administration, I don't think you would find that they were particularly nouny. I, I suspect they might be very verby. Um, so I'm trying to think about, you know, how to describe that shift in American politics and American political discourse. And I'm thinking what might be at stake here is that um, a nouny political discourse, when it polarizes, polarizes in terms of values, right? And a verby political discourse polarizes in a different way. Right. Responsibility might not capture what it's doing. It seems to be about, about a sort of very actant-oriented um, um, worldview um, that I think, and you know, I think might be interesting to think about. Um, and if politics is all about um, you know different ways of drawing the distinction between friend and enemy, you could say that that's what's happening here, right? That the nouny discourse sets a boundary stone differently from a verbi discourse. Um, and what I had for Thomas, um, you know, Thomas, uh, your talk reminded me in some ways of um, um, what uh, Jingying shared with us about the wall as, a, as an object, but also as a sign, uh, the wall or the screen. And I was thinking just like in her case um, uh, with the wall, you know, questions arise about what one does 
at the stone, what one does at the terminus with the terminus. Um, and I thought your, 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 your descriptions were very interesting, you know, about a kind of endless activity of supplementation that takes place underneath the stone, about the stone, above the stone, but all these supplements just seem to uh, uh, end up breaking down the term terminus. Uh, what I thought was interesting is your own performance around that term, term, right? At one point you mentioned the play, um, I expected you to answer to, to, to Tim's question earlier, what is the minimal unit? Not Tom as your answer, but Ter as your answer, T-E-R. So at one point you make that play, right? The Ter minus, right? The subtracting away from the term. I'm wondering, is there something irreducible that provokes anxiety about this term, term, terminus? If there is, and it is maybe captured by the word tear, it would, or the word tear, the, the, the thing tear, you know what I mean? Those three letters tear, that leads me in two directions. One, that this anxiety is all about terror, it's all about land, it's all about property, right? But the other tear is also three, right? That the anxiety is about counting. That the, term, that the terminal stone, the boundary stone, when laid, that laid down, to divide something into two actually divides it into three. So we have time for two rather short answers because we are running out of time. Okay, I'll go first. Um, uh, uh, thank you, Zachary, for, for great questions. Um, uh, yes, responsibility is not really enough. Uh, I agree with you. Um, within the context of an analyzing Czechoslovak and Czech presidents and, and contrasting the socialist presidents and non-socialist presidents, um, it's, it's a, a good a sort of like a tool to, to compare. Uh, and you can see how the communist presidents were actually uh, were afraid. Uh, there were lots of like internal struggles. And, and so they, it, they were afraid of actually taking responsibility. It actually fits in with the thoughts of Havel's emphasis on personal responsibility. But you're right about the others, the other post-communist leaders who are more like one of them is really Trump-like and populist. So there, there are things to, to think about. Thank you very much. Um, and I think that's, that's we can talk later. <laughs> Thomas. Uh, thank you, Sakari. That's a very good question. Uh, this uh, particle tear, indeed, is it's a it's a the first a syllable of uh, uh, it's it's an emblem of terra cut into pieces. Uh, but then it's also uh, the third, the question of the third, and whether the third is given or uh, not. Um, and there is indeed throughout these uh, scholastic uh, uh, sums um, a tension between what one may call, and especially when it comes to these, um, to the counting of these uh, suppositions, between a binary scheme, uh, proper, improper, and so on and so forth, and a trinitary scheme, which is uh, bound to um, Christian theology. So this tension between including the third and excluding the third is, is, goes to the core of, of the theological uh, uh, and, 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 and the, the relation of language to, to, uh, to theological questions. But this is just a, a very short remark. Uh, it would have to be uh, unfolded other way and otherwise. Thank you. So uh, please join me in thanking our two speakers for a wonderful panel and thank you all for your great comments. <laughs>